So, Augustine of Canterbury. So St. Augustine, born in the early uh, 6th century, and died in May of 6, 604. He was a Benedictine monk who became the first Archbishop of Canterbury. He became the Archbishop of Canterbury in 597. Uh, and uh, he baptized over 10,000 Christians on Christmas Day of 597 after reintroducing Christianity to southern, southeastern England. He was busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, busy day. Founded the monastery of St. Peter and St. Paul, which later became known as Augustine, uh, uh, Monastery of Augustine or Augustine's Monastery. And actually that lasted for over a thousand years that was finally dissolved in the mid 19th century. Um, I'm looking for the date here, eight, 18, um, 1848. So that lasted a long time. He also founded the King's School in Canterbury, the world's oldest continuously operating school, which is still operating today. Oh. The story of the story of Augustine, why did he come to Kent, England? In Kent, uh, you know, the Canterbury area, the uh, southeastern part of England that kind of juts out into the sea. Uh, so why did Augustine come here? Well, um, as you all know, Christianity was established in England even in the first centuries of Christianity. Uh, we believe uh, one of the original 12 apostles actually came up to England to establish Christianity. It, there were priests and bishops and Christians and churches in England before Rome invaded England, uh, before Rome took over England in the 300s or 200s. And, um, and certainly when Rome invaded, they brought their Christianity with them as well. So, But what happens in the 6th century with the uh, Jutes and Angles and uh, Saxons invading from Germany... Uh, they, they were not Christians yet at that point in their history. And so they brought their paganism back with them. The existing Christianity, the, the pre-Roman Christianity of the British Isles got driven into the North and the West, into Wales, Ireland, and Scotland. Pockets of it remained in England proper, uh, but it was pretty suppressed by the, uh, the pagans, the return of paganism for a couple of centuries. And this is what Pope Gregory the First wanted to fight against. He wanted to restore uh, Christianity in England that had been suppressed and driven out into the hinterlands. And uh, he was also, when he was a priest, for whatever reason, he was fascinated with the Angles, the fair skin. You know, Pope was an Italian, Middle Eastern, Mediterranean fellow, dark, complected, dark skin, dark hair, so forth, and for whatever reason, was fascinated with the fair-haired, blonde, blue-eyed, red-headed uh, Scandinavian slash English type people. So he had wanted to start a mission to England for quite, quite a few years, was unable to get it together until he became Pope. And of course, becoming Pope gave him a little more power to make something like that happen. By the way, we have... Uh, David joining, Rob's, Rob's joining us, just to let you know. Hi, everybody. Welcome, Rob. Good, mo good morning, Rob. But glad you're here, Rob. We, we just got started. So Pope Gregory says, um, let's get a mission together and go out to England and try to bring Christianity back to this uh, pagan world that was once, once belonged to Christianity and was lost. And, uh, you know, some of the reasons behind this, one of the was the papacy at that point was kind of at a low point of influence. And he was thinking this would be a, a good thing to bring um, some prestige back to the office of Pope. Uh, so there was some political interest in it as, as well. 
this accomplishment of bringing Christianity back to England would look really good for the, for the papacy. Anyway, he selected, he selected um, Augustine. Augustine, uh, oh, geez. hang on, sorry, my computer's being sluggish. So he sent Augustine over to England to try to convert people back to Christianity. And here's about how, uh, you know, the Roman, Roman withdrawal from Britannia in 410. It's when you, that set up the stage for Saxons and Jutes and, and Angles from Germany. These were all Northern tribes of Germany. So the ancient Germans invading England, which, you know, they became, the Saxons became the ruling class of England for centuries after that until the Norman invasion. So, you know, if you look at the history of England, they were really probably more Celtic originally than they were taken over by the Germans for a few centuries and they were taken over by the Northern French for a few centuries. So, you know, it became Saxon slash Angle, where we have the word England from, came from comes from Angle, Ang, the Angles who invaded it. And then later on, the Normans, the Northern French invaded, it, and they became the ruling class for a few centuries. And the Norman French language became the language of the upper classes and the rulers. Right. right. Which, is, which is why beef, the word beef comes from French, buff, um, because they were the masters and the Angles and Saxons were the servants and they were the ones who used their language for the same animal, cow, cattle, etc. That would that would be the ang. Oh, and the interesting. same way with pig and pork, the uh, finished meat that was brought to the table was the French word and the English the old Angle word was for the living animal because they were the tenders of the animals, the butchers and the cooks. So the a whole lot of the English language is divided with the French background or the the Saxon and Angle. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Linguist little linguistic history there, yeah. Yeah. Well the, the whoever the conquering invaders are linguistically, they become the more sophisticated, so to speak, language. Same thing happened with the Romans. When, when Rome would invade someplace, the, the Latin words would become the more sophisticated. Right, right. Because after all, they brought us plumbing and, and so forth. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, a wonder, it's a wonder with the Germans invasion there that, that we didn't have more Germanic. Uh, well, maybe we do in our language, but. Well, we do. And, you know, I mean, English, linguistically speaking, English is really a derivation of German, old German. Yes. Yeah. Don't forget but, also you know, that it's heavily influenced by Latin and, and French and all the other languages, but it is originally an old German. Don't forget that the Anglo Saxon background is the Germanic. Yeah, yeah. Don't that's forget that the Normans also were, um, they were invaded by the Scandinavians. So basically, right. there's a lot of Scandinavian blood in the Norman lines. Yes. I've always been fascinated by linguistics and look at all these tree language trees and where they all came from and how they influence each other it's 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 pretty intriguing and uh, uh you know I, I i'm pretty good at my german i wouldn't say i'm fluent yet but i'm getting there and i have a friend from high school who's dutch and when they post stuff in, on oh. in their dutch language i can make out most of what they're saying even though i've never studied dutch because it's so close yeah linguistic <clears throat> Anyway, so, you know, so here we are. So Pope Gregory the first is sending Canterbury back to England to try to restore Christianity. There, there was this thinking at the time amongst Augustine and his other, he brought like 40 priests with him. It was a big group. It wasn't just him. And they all, oh, wow. the pagan stronghold, there's not any Christianity there. And there was almost an impression as if there was no Christianity in England, but you know, and, and sometimes we forget that Christianity in England goes all the way back to the beginning of Christianity. And they were martyrs. We talked about Alban. When we first started this class, we talked about martyr Alban. This is pre 
before this time, before Canterbury, before Augustine, there were martyrs, Alban, Justice, and Aaron. Um, there were, in, in ancient history of England, we, we know that three bishops were sent from England to the Council of Arles in 314. And we know that England was invited to the Nicene Council in 325, um, which by the way, they never made it because they couldn't afford to go. They didn't have the money. And, and England, England bishops were the only ones not represented at Nicaea, but they were invited. And then this record of a Gaulish bishop uh, going to the island to settle disciplinary matters. So we know that before Augustine was there, Christianity was still there. And it may have even, and it, and it certainly was driven out and suppressed by the, <clears throat> by the, by the um, pagan Saxons, but it was still there. There was Christianity all along. So there, there was somewhat of this attitude by the Pope and by Augustine that I'm bringing Christianity to England, but it wasn't really bringing as much as trying to restore. In fact, a lot of the, the, Celt, the when we talk about the Celtic Christianity, the Celtic church, that's the native British church developing in isolation from Rome before Rome, and, uh, before Rome finally got influence and uh, leadership over England, uh, which is after this time. And this is kind of the beginning of that. This is that struggle for Rome to control England and not just be a Celtic Christian nation kind of began with, with Augustine. So Augustine was a, was a prior of a Benedictine monastery of St. Andrew in Rome. I had to look up prior because I don't know what that was. It's, it's an ecclesiastical title for a superior. It's kind of a generic title. Uh, and generally they weren't as high up as an abbot or an abbess, but, but they had some sort of administrative responsibilities. In fact, um, the Pope was um, formally in that monastery. So Augustine was a, had prior authority over uh, the Pope. And so when he chose Augustine to go to England, it wasn't just like a random priest that he had heard good things about. This was his former leader. So he must have thought a great deal about Augustine's abilities and respected his abilities. But when Augustine and his uh, entourage were heading there, uh, him and his 40 priests, uh, they had this fear of the, the Saxons uh, in England being a very... Um, violent and brutal uh, they just thought it was a suicide mission and they along the way several times tried to get it canceled or turn around and go back to uh, mainland Europe go back to Rome uh, so they kind of thought this was going to be a suicide mission going to Canterbury to convert the pagans but ultimately of course they went uh, and their goal was to meet with King Ethelbert King Ethelbert was a king of uh, Kent. And of course, back then it was not unified, and we had a lot of a lot of different kings of the British Isles. And so, you know, why why was Kent chosen? Yeah. Partly, it was chosen because you know we knew that the Pope knew that Ethelbert was married to a Christian. He was married to Bertha. She was the daughter of the King of Paris, King Cheribert the First, and they were hopeful that she had had some influence over the king, would soften his heart and mind towards Christianity. Also, Kent was chosen because it was the dominant power of that time in southeastern Britain, uh, due to the eclipse of the King of Wessex recently. Uh, Ethelbert had become the most prominent king in that region. So let's try to influence the, the most prominent king. And of course, geographical access, the region was easy to get to from mainland Europe. And uh, Augustine had landed on an island called the Isle of Thanet. The Isle of Thanet's listed there on the Google Maps picture that I took and it's no longer an island is in the 1500s, it kind of filled in with soot, uh, with silt, silt. Uh, so there was a channel running through there at one point. It's now actually not an island anymore. Uh, 
but when Canterbury went there, it was an island. Or when uh, Augustine went there. So Augustine landed on the Isle of Thanet with his 40 priests. Um, and it met King Ethelbert. In 597. In fact, it was separated by a body of water called the Watson Channel. It even had a name. I was fascinated by the fact that it was an island when he got there, and it's no longer an island. <laughs> yeah. It seems surprising that they would close off in that short of geo time of geographical history, but it did. Out of curiosity, the island, I looked these facts up. The first bridge to the island was actually built in 1485, and there was small boat navigation until the 16th century. There was even a ferry from Sandwich, which operated until 18th century. But eventually silt built up, making it unnavigable. Like I said, no longer an island. Mm -hmm. So King Ethelbert married Bertha. One of the terms of the marriage was that she would be allowed to restore this church. There's an old Roman church there. They're not even sure what it dated to. They're thinking the 200s. The church building was still there, and she was allowed, as a term of her marriage, she was allowed to restore that church and have a priest come out there to minister communion. So this whole idea that Augustine and the Pope and his entourage had in their head that they were going to this hostile country where they would be murdered instantly was kind of an overinflated anxiety and fear since the king was already friendly at least towards Christianity and marrying a Christian and allowing her to have a church. So they were actually well received when they landed there. Uh, the church that she had restored is, is the current church of St. Martin. It is the oldest continuously operating English speaking church in the world. And when, the, when Veronica and I went there um, a couple years ago, this is actually a picture from my iPhone here. Yeah, I was, uh, these, and these are pictures that I took too. Wow. Oh, here comes, wow. uh, here comes Kathy and Dave, or Kathy, uh, Dave, here comes Dave. Rob, you're muted. You need to push your button. <laughs> oh yeah, Rob's oh, muted. Push your button. There you go. <laughs> Well, I was afraid uh, my if it, my computer made some background noise. That's oh. what uh, I don't know if it's doing it now, but you know it has in the past. I don't hear it today. Well, then maybe I'll, I'll remain unmuted for a while. <laughs> hey, Dave. Good morning. Good morning, Dave. Welcome, Dave. How's everybody? Good. Wonderful. Doing great. Good. Bud's in the hospital, though. Yeah, he has a oh. fever. What's going on? He has a fever, 104. It's not COVID. Oh. That's all we know so far. So add him to your prayer list for the day. Is he in Baptist East or North? Yes, he is. Baptist. Yeah. Okay. So... Uh, Miracle Today we were just talking about St. Augustine of Canterbury and how he went back to England to restore Christianity to England after the Saxons had invaded and driven Christianity uh, into the uh, hinterlands. And this is the church, St. Martin's Church, the oldest continuously operating English-speaking church in the world, which, which King Ethelbert's wife, Bertha, had restored. Of course, it wasn't this big when she restored it. It was just a little chapel. Uh, let me see if I can get my um, laser beam on. I always forget how to do that here. Laser pointer. So this part right here is the old part. You see that right. cove set in. Okay. Kind of, kind yeah. of like our church. Yeah. yeah. The, front, the front half is the old church. So Veronica, Veronica and I went to England a couple of years ago. We went to London and Canterbury, and we knew that we knew about this church. We went went to the door, and they they were closed when we went there. But they had a prayer service the next day. I was and I was determined to go there, no matter what the service was. They could have been sacrificing goats. I would have gone there. <laughs> 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 so 
So we went to a we went to a prayer service, which was really oh, in fact, there's the back of I didn't even notice that. That's my wife right there. Oh yeah. Aww. All right. This, this, this is the priest over here. So we went to a prayer service, and this this back part here is what Queen Bertha around 597 had restored into a church and then later they added on and it's, it's been an active parish since then um it has never stopped being a parish that's what makes it the oldest continuously operating english-speaking church in the world so uh, speaking of we're talking about the venerable bead earlier according to the venerable bead Mm -hmm. happened uh, with this meeting between Ethelbert and Augustine is uh, agreed to hear Augustine out. Uh, however, they had to have the meeting outside and not in a building because the king believed <laughs> Augustine's magic could only work on him inside a building. So they had a meeting outside where, where uh, Augustine could not use his magic on Ethelbert. Oh. <laughs> well, there you are. Uh, <laughs> but wonder if, he only, wonder if he only met his wife outside. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he may have, have had different magic. I don't know. <laughs> but Ethelbert liked him and let him allowed him to preach freely, and gave him two plots of land that he could use. Uh, one one of those plots of land is where the Canterbury Cathedral now stands. So that was a gift from King Ethelbert. And the other is, is, of course, St. Martin's Church. And, and this, this picture I put in the, this was supposed to follow the other pictures. This is a, uh, from a giant church. No, giant. It's about as big as, uh, about as big as my dining room table. It's not really huge, but. So this sign is in front of the church, St. Martin's Church, showing you the stages of development, you know, going back to the, salmon colored ones that are going back to Ethelbert and Bertha. Oh that's cool. This yeah. this is this is the part that this is the part that was probably from the Roman era, maybe about 200 AD. And then when Bertha came along they they were allowed to expand it. And then the Norman the Norman expansions are in the green color. And then there was there was a building of the eight eight hundredths of this. So nothing major has been built in the last uh, seven hundred years. The church is pretty much exactly as it's, you know, since before since before Columbus discovered America, the church is essentially changed. So I just fascinating. Yes. Augustine was finally consecrated as a bishop in 597, having had great success in converting these pagans to Christianity. Uh, and while he is certainly credited with bringing Christianity back in full force to England, you know, one, of, one of his mistakes that he made, and historians have said this is like his only really serious mistake he made, was there were these other priests and bishops already in England who had been following the Celtic line of Christianity, and uh, and Augustine tried to bring them under command of the Roman Catholic version of doing things. Because there was, and honestly, the differences in liturgies and how things were done were not huge differences. There were minor differences, but Augustine thought they should fall in line with Rome because here he's the bishop now, and. Uh, the Pope actually sent him a letter uh, saying, sent a letter to Augustine saying, you know what, if there's just minor differences, let them follow their own thing. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to be exactly the same in everything we do. Uh, but unfortunately, Augustine did not follow the Pope's advice on that. Tried to have them change their practices to match the Roman practices, which set up some contention previously existing bishops and priests in England and the Roman Catholic Church. And those kinds of tensions between those groups of schools of thinking never really went away, even up to the time when, when King Henry VIII said, okay, we're, we're, 
we're breaking ties again. There was always that element of the school of thought of the pre-Roman conquering of Christianity in England, of having their own independence. So Ethelbert was baptized probably about a year later because there was a letter Augustine wrote in 601, which referred to him as the Christian king. So it wasn't too long before uh, Ethelbert was also baptized. And Pope Gregory sent some more missionaries out to help with 601 with letters and gifts for the church. And that's just saying that Augustine tried to influence the British, native British bishops to fall in line with their way of doing things and create attention more than anything else. There were bishops uh, under the Pope's leadership established in London and Rochester. Being Augustine founded a school to train Anglo Saxon priests and missionaries. He also consecrated his successor, Lawrence of Canterbury who was part of the original 40 priests that came with to do the mission trip to convert England back to Christianity. Rob Schneider, yeah. Rob, you're making noise on your computer. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one of King, King Ethelbert and Queen Bertha's granddaughters became a saint as well, Saint Eanswith. She was the founder of the first nunnery in England. So their conversion back to Christianity lasted for a little while. Although there were more waves of paganism to come in the history of England, we kind of bounced back and forth between Christianity and paganism for a while. But for a couple of generations, it stayed there pretty, pretty, pretty solidly. Then these are some more pictures from our uh, trip uh, oh. that we went on. These are the ruins of Augustine's monastery in Canterbury. Thank you, Henry the Eighth. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, a lot of stuff was lost and destroyed unnecessarily. So but he had to have his money for his wars. So, and he wanted his marriage to Anne Boleyn too. Yeah. So anyway, those those are the ruins. Mm. There's also this nice monument uh, to Saint Augustine which was actually commissioned in 1884 by the Earl of Granville, who was at the time the Minister for Foreign Affairs and the Lord Warden of the Sink Ports. And he wanted to commemorate the meeting point between Augustine and Ethelbert. As you can see, it's outside where the magic can't get to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so he modeled after uh, uh, some 8th and ninth century crosses, but it was actually built in 1884, and the carvings illustrate the Christian story on the west side, the Annunciation, Virgin Child, Crucifixion, the north side of the 12 apostles, and south side, list 14 early Christian martyrs, and the east side has uh, the story of Saint, uh, Saint's album, Saint Augustine and Ethelbert. Might be interesting to see that monument someday. Mm -hmm. Latin inscription commemorating Ethelbert, composed by the Dean of Christ Church, carved from the base of the cross, which is translated from Latin into English. After many dangers and difficulties by land and sea, Augustine landed at last on the shores of Richbar, an Isle of Thanet. On this spot, he met King Ethelbert and preached his first sermon for our countrymen. Thus, he happily planted the Christian faith, which spread with marvelous speed throughout the whole of England, that the memory of these events be well preserved among the English Earl Granville Lord Warden Sinkports has erected this monument, AD 1884, which there's the map where 
outside of Ramsgate, in between Ramsgate and Minster, north of Sandwich. Mm -hmm. and, and also Veronica and I, uh, on our trip, we had to go have, we had to go to Sandwich and have a sandwich while we were in Sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what kind? <laughs> yeah. Mine was made up, mine was a shrimp with a rosemary sauce. Oh mm, my goodness. Nice. It was really good. I don't know what Veronica had, I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> She's shaking her head, she doesn't remember either. <laughs> Some organ meat or something. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not, I don't think she would eat organ meat, but I'm sure it was on the menu. <laughs> well. So that's the story of St. Augustine. We're gonna talk about Julian of Norwich next week. I think I discovered the noise that you hear. The no, what is it? The washing, I had the washing machine going, it's upstairs above where I'm sitting. Ah. So I just realized that just now that that's probably what the kind of noise is, so. <laughs> Well, there, it is, there, it. It is, there it is right now. Okay. Yeah, I hear it. Mm -hmm. What did you say next week again, Dave? Julian of Norwich. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, find, I find her quite fascinating. Interesting. interesting yes. Mm -hmm. Were you on your trip to England seeking the old churches or places where the saints were known or this just well anytime we go to europe that's always a part of you know i mm -hmm. both fascinated by the old churches in the history and you know as as you know if you've been to the churches in europe you just you feel this sense of awe you feel this connection with with centuries of Christianity when you're in one wow. of them. It feels like a holy place, you know? Mm -hmm. It's the fact yeah. that they've been there for so many centuries and the history they have. And... So many people. Yeah. And it, it was it was kind of a pilgrimage for me because I, I was still fairly new to the Episcopalian tradition, you know? And so for me, it was a... And I, I had recently discovered in my genetic ancestry that I had a couple of priests in my past in England. Oh. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd, and recently committed to the Episcopalian faith. So for me, it was kind of a spiritual pilgrimage too to go to Canterbury. And we did, uh, we did to go to, a, we did go to a communion service at the cathedral too. So it was pretty cool. Mm. 